What is up guys, Karma Medic here, and welcome back to another dose. If you're new to the channel, hi, my name is Nasser, and I'm now a fourth year medical student studying at King's College London, and today I'm joined by Ali Abdal. For the very few of you who don't know who Ali is, Ali, do you want to give like a little introduction? Sure. Hey guys, uh, my name is Ali. I am sort of a doctor, uh, based in, in, in the UK as well. Uh, I was at med school for six years, and then I was a doctor for two years. Uh, and for the last month, I've been taking a bit of a break from medicine. And I also have a YouTube channel. Um, and so I've been watching you for a long time. And like so I've, I've, I feel like I've, I've heard that intro so many times that it's, it feels, <laughs> it's like a bit, feels a bit surreal to be here right now with your mascot thing in the background, wherever it is. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Ali Abdal has a YouTube channel. He's very influential in the productivity, tech, time management space. And so I thought he would be a fantastic person to talk about comparing the life of a medical student to that of a doctor. So we're gonna go through a couple of topics, generally social life, sleeping habits, daily habits, studying, and things like that, that would be different between being a medical student and a doctor. So let's start off with social life. That's cool with you. Of course. So, you know, social life is obviously a huge part of university. And I feel like university sort of simplifies and makes it easier to have a social life because you're constantly surrounded by people in lecture. You have like clinical partners when you're in the hospital and things like that. So how does that translate over oh, to God, being 100%. a doctor? Like being a doctor sucks in terms of the social life <laughs> relative to university. Because, you know, as you said, at university, you're living with your friends, you're breathing with your friends. You're like all together in one place. And once you're a doctor, depending on which hospital you're at and what the vibe is, mm -hmm. that can either be pretty good or it can be not very good at all. In, in terms of the social scene. So for example, in my first year, I was at Addenbrooke's Hospital, which is a pretty big hospital in Cambridge. The social scene vibe amongst the doctors wasn't like, it was all right, but it wasn't the case that, you know, you'd be going around to your friend's house every evening like we would at medical school. Mm -hmm. And equally in my second year, where I was working in a much smaller hospital in a town called Bury St. Edmunds. Again, there was a bit of a social vibe, like the doctor's mess would hold events, you know, every couple of weeks, kind of this is pre-lockdown. It obviously wasn't as nice as in med school where you're literally living with your friends and you can like, you know, walk two minutes to to see someone and then walk back yeah. to your place. Like that is the main thing that university is just so good for. I feel like it's not really a difference between medical student and doctor. It's more a difference between student and working professional. Like mm -hmm. when you're a student, you are literally hanging out with friends all the time. And when you start to work, whatever field you're working in, whether it's medicine, law, like whatever other jobs exist in the world, <laughs> <laughs> what you find is that you will see your friends a lot less and you have to right. make much more of an effort to hang out with people. Yeah, I, I've heard that, that you have to constantly plan like weeks in advance what specific day and time you're going to be available and it honestly sounds like such a hassle and something that takes the fun out of socializing and meeting with yeah. people. Yeah, it's definitely a bit of a drag and, and, and this is one reason why I was, I, was, I was not very keen to go to London because I'd heard that in London specifically the vibe is very much that so people get booked up weeks in advance and you have to plan three weeks ahead to see a friend. You do have to put more intention into socializing in a way that right. I certainly didn't have to do at university where it just happens by default. Yeah, got to pencil it in then along with everything else. Absolutely, yeah, it's just another part of the schedule. It's it, it becomes, <laughs> more things to add to the schedule. Exactly, and it, it becomes another thing that feels like work. You're like, okay, Aww. I know I should take my relationship seriously. I know I should reach out to this person. Right. Um, but, you know, that's not to say it's bad. We just need to be more intentional about it than when we were at university. So the next thing, Ali, that I really want to know about is sleep schedule. Because in my life, generally, I've, I've never pulled an all-nighter for work. Not once. The idea of having to flip my sleeping schedule around between on-calls and normal day shifts, something that, like, seems kind of scary and seems so backwards. How yeah. could you possibly socialize and maintain relationships outside of work when you have such a backward sleep schedule? So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly when you're on night shifts, usually if you're, if you're doing nights, you'll be doing it for maybe three, like between three and six days at a time, sometimes even longer stretches than that. And so during that period, your sleep schedule is completely wrecked. Like for the first night, you kind of have to, have to stay up all night and then you'll kind of want to sleep the next day. You'll try and pre-sleep before your night shift, but that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then you'll do this kind of nocturnal thing where you're sleeping during the day and working during the night. And usually that means that actually there's not really much time for, for socializing. So that was certainly the case for me when I was working in A&E overnight because mm -hmm. you don't really rest when you're, when you're doing that. Stuff just keeps on happening. Right. But depending on what placement you're on, like when I was on my psychiatry placement, I'd be doing nights and often I would only have to do maybe one or two hours of stuff during the night. Okay. And so I would sleep the rest of the time in the on-call room. Where would you sleep? Oh, we had an on-call room. Like a bed? Like a bed, like a little just sofa, desk, sink, oh, everything. Oh, no way, okay. Uh, with like curtain, lights, fan, like, like, like a whole shebang. <laughs> and you would just okay. get get called on the kind of special phone thing or bleeped right. if you had to, I don't know, prescribe a drug or to clock in a new patient. Could you switch on that fast though? Like from being asleep, you get this phone call and then you have to go take a history. Uh, Yeah, you become pretty adept at it you because at it. because okay. like when you're sleeping, you kind of know that, okay, that I'm, I, I'm, I'm living on borrowed time here. Like I know I don't deserve <laughs> to sleep to right now. <laughs> I'm not allowed to do this, but 
I'm going to try and get a few hours. Okay. And, and, and so certainly I had, I had a few days on psychiatry where I'd be sleeping the whole night. Really? And then you're free the next day and it, it feels like, oh my God, I've suddenly unlocked. You've gained time. I've gained free time because yeah. now I can kind of go shopping and go to the post office and pick up all the 18 parcels that have racked up because, you know, the post office doesn't open on weekends and all, <laughs> all, all of these little things or even grab a random coffee with a friend. So I think it, it really depends on how busy the placement that you're on is. Okay. Uh, but it does kind of vary. That's really interesting to hear because obviously at university, most of the time you can set a relatively steady sleeping schedule. You'll usually have lectures starting at like 9 a.m. They'll almost never start at 8 and if they're starting later, then mm -hmm. you can sleep in or not. But you almost always know what time you're going to be waking up, what time you're going to be sleeping and it provides a bit of consistency in your life. Oh, I don't know. Like. For me, I felt like my sleep schedule at university was a lot more wacky than it was working. Fair enough. I, I will say that yeah. maybe I'm like not the norm for that. So do, do you turn uh, up to lectures every day? Oh, I well, I watch all the lectures, but I do it online. Okay. Um, so I don't, like I don't go in, in person. Yeah, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm like, I'm, okay. I'm there at the same time that the lecture starts, okay. but I'm just watching the previous ones online until that one gets uploaded. Oh, that's kind so of... So I'm always okay. a couple of lectures behind, yeah. but I always watch every single one. Okay. But back in Toronto, I would attend every single lecture because nothing was online. Okay. And if you missed what was said in lecture, you were kind of screwed because oh. there was nowhere else to get that information. Okay. Um, so yeah, I did attend every single lecture for sure. Damn. Um, and so I, I had a really good <laughs> so sleep So you had schedule. a decent sleep schedule. I've always had a good sleep schedule, yeah, like seven hours and then I'm good. Yeah, for, so f for me, working life was more like that because even though we do have night shifts, usually it's like, I don't know, at the very worst, it'll be maybe one week every month or one week every two months. So actually, for, for most of the time, you have a, a reasonably solid schedule. And, and for me, for the last eight months, I was on obstetrics and gynecology, thanks to COVID, didn't swap over <coughs> as we normally do every four months. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have any nights for that. So it was pure daytime, daytime work. And so I would, every single day, Without fail, I'll be waking up at half past six to get into work by 8 a.m. Whereas at university, you know, going into lectures is optional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whereas when you're working, going into work is not optional at all. <laughs> That's another thing. Like, yeah. if you, if, like, when you're in university, if you wake up late or if you miss a lecture, like, it's fine. Yeah. But when you're at work, you, you can't show up oh, e God. even yeah, like 10, 15 minutes late. It's just, yeah, it's non optional. So it's just not a thing. It's not a thing, right? Yeah. So, in a way, it kind of removes the optionality from your life. And so you don't have that um, sensation of everyday thinking. Do I really want to go in today? Or like every hour really kind of reconsidering that. Do I really want to stay in placement? Or do I just want to go to the mess? Or do I just want to go home? Mm -hmm. When you're when you're at work, you're at work. And so that just True. that that strand of decision making from your life gets completely obliterated. You don't even think about it. Yeah. yeah it's just it just not an Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like it's like going to school. It's it's like you wake up, you go to school. True. It's it's not even an option. True. Whereas at university, it's every, every day is an option. <laughs> so moving on to sort of uh, technology or apps or things that we use to keep us productive while we're in medical school. I know for me, the iPad has completely revolutionized how I take notes in university, how I keep my life organized. And I know that was the same case for you when you were in university. And then I also know that you started using your iPad in the hospital as well. Mm. So can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so I used to take my iPad Pro with me to work. And the cool thing about that was in my first hospital, you know, big central teaching hospital in Cambridge, they were using an entirely electronic system called Epic, uh, which mm -hmm. is used in like America and Australia as well. And, there, and that had an iPad app. So I could literally do whatever I wanted oh, to from my iPad. That's and amazing. This, and, and this was life changing because if you're on a night on call, you can literally just sleep in the, on the sofa in the doctor's mess with your iPad next to you. And if someone bleeps you and says, I need a drug prescribed, you don't you have do to- You can do it on the app. You can do it on the app. Oh, you, you, you don't have to log into a computer, right? No, it, like, it, it mimics the computer thingy on your iPad. So you can just oh. like, literally do everything from the iPad. Okay. Equally, when I was on surgery and we'd be doing ward rounds at seven o'clock in the morning because the surgeon has to rush off to theater mm -hmm. and you're going around different wards in the hospital, it, there is a significant ball ache to trying to find a computer logging in, blah, 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 blah. But I would just take my iPad with me and therefore I'd perch on the bedside and just type up and they'd be like, oh, damn. This is actually like genuinely making the whole team more productive. And so did you use it for the full two years? I used it for the first year where we had this electronic system. In my second year, oh, we didn't okay. have an electronic, we had an electronic system, but it was a bit more archaic. Mm -hmm. It was a bit more Windows 95. You couldn't compared. use the actual iPad. I couldn't use the actual iPad. Um, I'd still take my iPad with me because for example, I have this thing called productive downtime, which is when you're a doctor, like there are lots of moments of downtime throughout the day, like mm -hmm. half an hour here and there where you're waiting for blood results to come back or you know, you've got a breather where you just happen to not have any patients coming in to see you for that half an hour window. If I had my iPad with me, I'd find that I'd be able to bash out like a script for a video or something like that. True. Um, and so that was sort of my productive uh, productive procrastination uh, when I was at work, but I didn't use it for medical stuff. That's, um, that's actually very similar to how I feel now when I'm on placement, because mm. 
you know, when you're on placement, you have like pockets of learning that happen throughout the day. It's very like spontaneous and it's not really that planned. And so anytime I can, I'll pull out my iPad and try and do something, whether that's like updating my portfolio or like reviewing like a clinical exam that I need to do or something like that. That's or very good working of you to say like, that. <laughs> no, no, or working on like YouTube scripts oh, and okay, things cool. like that. Yeah, a <laughs> healthy mix of both. That is. Um, but it's like, uh, how, how much of the line are you going to toe? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing <laughs> I do at work is work on my portfolio. I think is the technical thing you're supposed to say. <laughs> I do both. I do both. I do. But yeah, no, when I'm at the hospital, I try and get as much work as I can done there. Because once I go home, that's when I enter like YouTube mode or oh. like extracurriculars or social life. Um, so I try and get work done while I'm still there. So something I've been thinking about a lot now that I'm in fourth year is how my role in the hospital has changed as a medical student. So in my second year and third year, when I show up at the hospital and introduce myself as a second or third year medical student, you know, people wouldn't really want you to get involved and they're sort of, they know that you're almost more of a burden than you are a practical and useful part of the team. Mm. And then now when I show up to the hospital and I introduce myself as a fourth year medical student, suddenly eyes light up and they're like, oh, okay, you can actually help me. You can write in the notes now, you can go do an exam for me and report that back. Obviously it makes sense that every year you go up in medical school, you gain more responsibility. But obviously as a doctor, all the responsibility actually falls on you. You're not really, I mean, you're still reporting to people, but you do have things that you are directly in charge of. Yeah. So can you talk about like what that transition is like? Cause I'm scared. I'm yeah. scared to go from fifth year to an F1. Yeah, it's, it's definitely daunting initially mm -hmm. and the sort of, I, I was I was laughing a bit at what you just said because for us, like the first year of clinicals is fourth year. And so if someone says they're a fourth year medical student, you assume, okay, this person knows absolutely like less than nothing and you have to start from, from, from ground zero. Definitely that transition of responsibility is a big one. And the weird thing is that I think that that shift of when you're a final year medic, medical student to when you become a doctor, there is no difference at all in terms of your knowledge or anything like that. In fact, you True. probably know more things as a final year medical student just having just passed exams. you just did the exams, yeah. You probably know, know more medicine than I did because you've just passed the SMLE. SMLE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but when you have that responsibility, you kind of grow into the role that you have responsibility for. Okay. And so I think if you're on a, if you're on a team whereby the registrar, the senior is holding your hand a lot, mm -hmm. then you can feel, you do feel a bit less involved. Whereas certainly I found that where like on, on days where I was the one who had to check up all the bloods and make sure everything was okay. I was the one, sort of the only one who was gonna write these eight discharge letters. Right. Having that responsibility makes the job itself a lot more fun. And I, I kind of joke about how being a medical student is less fun than being a doctor. When you're actually at work, being a doctor is quite fun because you are responsible for this thing happening. And obviously you've got like senior support and stuff if you need it and you rarely you're out of your depth. But when you're the one who has to do it, then you, you, end, you end up just doing it. You know, if you tell me a patient's name, I'll be able to recite their blood results for you because when you have that responsibility, you just switch into that mode of knowing what's going on. That's a, that's a good point because I always, I'm always asking myself, like, how do these doctors know who is in what bed and what their heart rate was, their yeah. blood pressure, their blood <laughs> results? And I'm like, I was there with you. I was on that ward round trying to follow along and I can't remember it. But I guess it's the same with like driving. Like if you're the one driving to a destination, mm -hmm. you'll remember how to get there. Whereas if you're a passenger sort of observing, you won't necessarily pay attention to that. Exactly, yeah. Um, and the, this was something that, that used to baffle me as well. Like how the hell does it, you know, what's this patient's crap? Mean. How, how do you know that it's 497? But then when I'm in that position where I'm the only one who knows, of course I know it's 497. It's, it's, just, it's just one of those magical feelings where responsibility leads to you kind of growing into the role. Yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to it, honestly. And mm -hmm. I'm excited to move from sort of the observing position to actually doing. Yeah. And I think that's when it's going to become the most fun and the most engaging and everything. And you're into teaching and stuff. So when you get your, your baby medical students, you can yes, send, you can send them off and do stuff that. and yeah, yeah. you'll empathize with the role of a medical student. So you'll actually get them involved in doing things Absolutely. rather that's than treating I've them as an accessory. Yeah, nice. I've promised myself I'm going to involve medical students as much as I possibly can. Yeah. And certainly I found that any anytime I have students, I feel like, yes, I have another, I have another team member with me. I'd be like, right, you. I, and you I find that them. when you when you give them responsibility, that it's your job to take the history and come up with a plan. Tell me what's wrong with this patient. If you don't know, Google it, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll we'll take it from there. Because I'm busy doing something else. And the feedback I've gotten is that they really appreciate having that responsibility thrust on them, as it were. We're almost looking for times when someone senior tells us to do something because mm. it's so much more difficult. There's so much friction in putting yourself out there and asking to do that yeah. thing. <laughs> it's it's I mean it's easier when someone tells you to do it. But yeah. so the next thing that I want to tackle is sort of studying oh. habits, research academia and things like that. So obviously, as a medical student, we spend a decent amount of time studying, especially there's a lot of lectures we need to go through, clinical skills and exams that we need to learn. And I found that throughout the first three years of medical school, it was sort of easy for me to go to the library and block off four hours to do some learning or like two hours here, two hours there. Yep. No problem. Now in fourth year, that's becoming quite a bit more difficult. We're in the hospital from nine till four, almost for sure. 
Ready? Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> well, like, we're, like, we're like sign-ins and stuff. Yeah. We have to sign in with a QR code on our phone. No. And it gets tracked. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're in there quite a bit. Yeah. And I find that, you know, after a long day of being on the wards, it's hard to schedule in, like, studying time. Yes. And especially by the time I get home after I've commuted, like, an hour or so, all I want to do is chill. I want to have dinner. I want to work on my other things, like, enjoy life a little bit. Mm. And, you know, as a doctor, obviously, you still have exams. You still have sign-offs. You have your portfolio. Mm. So when do you squeeze in time for these things? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think when you're in the run-up to preparing for an exam for the sort of two or three months before then, or sometimes even one month, then people will go get home from work and bang out two hours of work every day mm -hmm. uh, studying for the exam. When you're not in exam prep mode, you basically don't do any studying at all. You just okay. like completely don't care about it anymore. If you need to learn something, you'll Google it there and then, and then you'll know it. And if you prescribe a drug enough times, you just memorize the dosage of it, just, mm -hmm. just kind of by default. So I found that for my first two years of being a doctor, I basically didn't do any extra work beyond- once you got home. Yeah, once I got home, beyond mm -hmm. if I was thinking about preparing for the USMLE, for example, and think, oh, let me bust out some bit of pathoma or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But like the portfolio things, you do have to keep on top of it. Usually you can find time at work to actually do it. Okay. So I would find, and, and this is true for basically all of my friends as well, we, it, it's, it's a much firmer separation between work and life when you're working as a doctor compared to when you're a student. Because when you're a student, there is always one more exam to prepare for. Yeah, there is always yeah. another publication slash project that has been in the works for the last three years that you're yep. working on. Yep. There's always <laughs> something that you signed up with some society to do three years ago and now you regret it, but you've signed <laughs> up for it, so you have to keep doing it. Uh -huh. it, it like, the work is never ending when you're a student, but when you're a doctor, you come home and you can switch off. That's true. That, that's a really good point that once you leave the hospital, you don't have an exam to study for most of the time. Mm -hmm. You don't have any like extra homework to do or like research for a quality improvement project or something. Yeah. So yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to that when you can draw a line in the sand and sort of move into relaxation mode. That's quite nice. So moving on to extracurriculars, so things like exercise, hobbies and things like that, we're obviously both quite heavily integrated into this whole YouTube thing. Yeah. We're, we're pretty committed at this point. Pretty committed. Um, so yeah, that's something obviously that for me, it's, it's like a non-negotiable in my life. I know you've talked about this non-negotiable idea before. A YouTube video has to go live every Thursday at 8.30 a.m. Like pretty much no matter what, unless I've given myself a very good reason for why I'm taking a break. Okay. And similarly with exercise, you know, every two days I have to do exercise, whether that's gym, running, like whatever it is, basketball, it has to happen. Does that translate well to when you're a doctor or do things just come up and you run over time? Like you're supposed to finish at mm. five, but then you don't. How do you organize all of that and make sure it still happens? Again, this kind of depends on which placement you're on. Okay. For some of my placements, I would finish at 5 p.m. on the dot. And so mm -hmm. I would know that, okay, it, it takes me half an hour to drive home. I will be able to get to Squash Club every Tuesday without fail at 6 p.m. And then that is kind of scheduled into my life. Mm -hmm. When I was a student, I couldn't really do that because we were always on placement. And I yeah. certainly from clinical years onwards, there's almost no way you can actually stick to a defined commitment unless you're willing to commute quite a long way. But a lot of the time, depending on which placement you're on, again, like when I was on surgery, sometimes mm. officially we're supposed to finish at half past five. Realistically, we'd end up finishing at half past six, seven, even sometimes half seven, eight. Okay. And so when there's stuff that you're scheduling kind of in that sort of danger zone between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., mm. you always kind of know that this, I'm probably not going to make squash club today. So you've got this like buffer where it's like probably don't schedule something yeah. in there. But if it's okay. like, you know, grabbing dinner with a friend at like 9 p.m., at mm -hmm. that point, you think you can think, okay, I'll definitely be <laughs> home at 9pm and able to make get to that. Yeah, I think like the worst thing about that, if you knew from the morning that you were going to be delayed till like 6.37, mm -hmm. like you could come to terms with it and sort of plan ahead. Yeah. But the worst thing is like halfway through the day or towards the end of the day, extra work comes on and then you realize you have to stay later. Oh mate, the worst thing ever is when the consultant rocks up at half past five when you're due to leave and says, right, let's do a board round where we go through all the patients or even worse, let's do a oh, ward round where we go around all the patients for a second <laughs> time and you're like, oh no. And then Ooh. that generally Ooh. more jobs and you think oh crap I need to discuss this urgent CT scan with radiology and the night, night team's not getting in until 9 p.m. and I can't leave because there's no one else to do this and then you stay behind because Oof. so whilst in medical school you know you're sort of obliged or supposed to be watching lectures or in clinical placement from Monday to Friday and then when the weekend comes Saturday and Sunday you have absolutely no obligation to do anything for medical school unless you're working on some sort of extracurricular project or studying for an exam hmm. as a doctor Sometimes you're working Saturdays and Sundays, and sometimes you're working Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yep. So how does that work in terms of rearranging your other parts of your life, your social life, because everyone else is free on the weekend? Yeah, this is probably one of the worst parts about having a job that makes you work weekends and nights mm. and stuff, is that inevitably a friend says, you know, do you want to go to Cornwall this on the 14th of September? And your response is, right, let me just check my rota. You're like, look, oh crap, I'm gonna call that weekend. Um, right, I know uh, John's on call the weekend before, I know Sally's on call the weekend after, I know that he's busy, there's basically no chance I'm gonna be able to swap that because mm. you can only request leave for stuff where you're not on call. 
Okay. And so if you're on call at a given date and you want to get leave on it, you have to swap it with someone for a normal day and then you can get leave on that day. And so this is like a real huge negotiating act. What me and some of my friends used to do and still do is that at the start, once we once we've all got our rotos, we would send out a doodle poll and be like, right, which weekend is everyone free on? Nice. And then we'll arrange a holiday, book the Airbnb, people can request leave two or three months in advance. That's a great idea. At that level. But nice. there's so many birthday parties I've missed because I've been I've been working. So many things True. I wanted to go to in London. So many like magic lectures. It's so sad. It's so like, yeah, you just can't go because you're like, well, I could maybe get to London for 7 p.m. But what if I finish later that day? There's no True. way I'm going to make it. And therefore, I don't want to commit to it. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, Ali, so I think that's everything that I wanted to ask you and everything that I wanted to discuss. Just to end this video, I wanted to ask if you have one piece of wisdom or one piece of advice that you could give to a fourth or fifth year medical student, yep. what would you say? Oh, man. What I'd say is that happiness is not found on the next rung of the ladder. Like, okay. you really want to enjoy the here and now because the here and now is all that we have. And when you're a medical student, if you're in that mode where you're thinking, oh my God, med school sucks, I hate it, I can't wait to be a doctor, I basically guarantee you're going to hate being a doctor as well. Because a lot of it, a lot of enjoying the job and enjoying the the stress and the, the, the long hours and the work and the responsibility, a lot of that is the story that we tell ourselves about it. And if we tell ourselves the story that this is fun, I'm enjoying this, we're gonna enjoy it. If we mm -hmm. tell ourselves the story of, I freaking hate being a medical student, I can't wait to be a doctor because it's gonna be so much better, it's not gonna be better. You're still gonna have those negative thoughts. You're still gonna be telling yourself the negative story that what you're doing right now is not fun. And so- I couldn't agree more. That's right, you know, please don't believe the myth that, you know, when you become a doctor, suddenly you'll be happy because that's just not the way forward. Be happy right now, enjoy your time and you'll be a doctor and you'll absolutely smash it. Yeah, awesome. I, yeah <laughs> that was excellent. Yeah. Um, like I, I completely agree with how you frame the situation that you're in plays such a huge role in how you enjoy your experience. Like yeah. people who complain constantly about whatever is happening around them. I'm like, you're literally putting yourself in this vicious cycle. You're asking to hate <laughs> everything around you. You're, you're attracting things that you don't like and you're making everyone else sort of go away from you as well. I think that's some great advice. Yeah, man. And Thanks, I'm very so. jealous that you've got another two years of med school left. It's gonna <laughs> I'm be very happy and I'm gonna yeah. take full advantage of them. Fantastic. All right, and that brings us to the end of this video. If you did enjoy it, please don't forget to leave a like and also subscribe to my channel to more content from me in the future. Also, if you're not already subscribed to Ali Abdel's channel, make sure you go do that immediately and we will see you in the next one. Peace. Nice. <laughs>